Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, another uh, chapter we're going to be jumping right into uh, from Emotionally Healthy Spirituality is uh, Enlarge Your Soul Through Grief and Loss. This week's um, going to be a little bit more uh, in depth on uh, the how to. Uh, this one's definitely not an easy one, so I would I would really uh, suggest you grab a pen and paper and uh, get ready to take some notes. I'm uh, excited for what God has planned for you. Take a look at the video from Peace Cazero. As we begin our fifth session together, let's get a sense of where we've come and how this session, Enlarging Your Soul Through Grief and Loss, fits in. We began the first week by looking at Saul and the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. And then we began to look at the seven pathways to an emotionally healthy spirituality. One, know yourself that you may know God. And we looked at David. He was a model of someone who, who knew God and he knew himself well. And this led to pathway two, going back to go forward. To know ourselves requires we understand and embrace where we've come from in our cultures and our families of origin and its impact on us. And this leads us to the wall, which is the third pathway, journey through the wall. Walls, as the ancients called it, are, are dark nights of the soul. There are times in our spiritual journey when God stops us through crises or circumstances beyond our control. These are times when God deeply transforms us in our understanding of, of who he is. Now the wall closely relates to our theme for this session, grief and loss. Now our culture routinely interprets losses as alien invasions that interrupt our normal lives. Jonathan Edwards, in a famous sermon on the book of Job, noted that Job's story is the story of all of us. Job lost everything in one day. Ten children in a disaster. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his health to such an extent that he was unrecognizable physically. But that happens to some of us actually instantly. But the story of Job is all of our stories because we will all lose everything. But for most of us, that will come more slowly over the span of a lifetime until we find ourselves on the door of death, leaving everything behind, all of our relationships, all of our possessions, and we will let go of all of our health. So we lose, for example, our youthfulness, and no amount of plastic surgery or cosmetics or a good diet or exercise is gonna stop that. We're gonna grow older. We lose our dreams. Who's not lost dreams? Dreams of a career, dreams of a marriage, dreams for children, dreams of hopes that we had. Uh, we experience losses as we go through transitions in life, and every time we change jobs or, or move, that's a loss. When our children grow more independent as they move through their own lives, that, that's a loss. As our influence and power in life decreases as we grow older, that's a loss. Most of us in, in one or more moments of our lives will also experience catastrophic losses. You know, unexpectedly a family member dies or, or a friend or a son uh, commits suicide or a spouse has an affair or we find ourselves single again after a, a painful divorce or a breakup. We find ourselves diagnosed with cancer or our company suddenly downsizes and we find ourselves unemployed. Our child is born severely handicapped. A loyal friend betrays us. Or we experience infertility or a miscarriage or broken friendship or mental illness or abuse in our childhoods. These are all losses. And then we grieve the many things that we can't do, our limits. Some people like me just lost a leg in a war in their family growing up. And so now they walk with a limp, much like I do, but I'm walking. We even lose our wrong ideas of God and the church. We find out that certain ideas we had about Jesus and what it meant to follow him, that they are inadequate. In fact, foolish perhaps, and maybe even wrong. And we feel betrayed by a church or a tradition or a leader, even God himself. We lose our illusions about the church and we discover it's not the perfect family with perfect people as we had expected. In fact, people disappoint us, and at times we are bewildered and we're shocked. Every person who lives in community with other believers sooner or later experiences this disillusionment and the grief that accompanies it. We all face many deaths in our lives. The choice is whether these deaths will be terminal, that is, crush our spirit and kill us, or they will open up new possibilities and depths of transformation for us in Christ. Now, every culture and family deals with grieving differently. Some of us, we come from families or cultures where sadness is a sign or was a sign of weakness. We weren't allowed to be depressed. 
The expectation was that you'd stuff it or move on. Others like mine, we did a lot of screaming and wailing, uh, but there was very little hope in God and people generally froze in time. In, in Western culture today, addiction has become perhaps the most common way to deal with pain or loss. We watch television for hours to not feel. We, we keep busy, running from one activity to another. We work 70 hours a week, get involved in pornography, we overeat, we drink, we take pills, anything to help us avoid pain. Some of us even demand that other people, someone, something, a marriage, a sexual partner, an ideal family, a child, an achievement, a career, a church, take our pain away. And we get angry at them when they don't. And then on top of this, in the church today, we have very little theology for anger and sadness and waiting and depression. You know, we say, how are you? We're asked after a loss or a disappointment in our lives. We say, couldn't be better. God's working all things for good. I just can't see it yet. And so we feel guilty for not obeying Scripture's command to, to rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4. So often in the church, we associate anger and sadness and grieving with being unspiritual, as if something's wrong with our walk with Christ. And, and we're convinced that we're, we're, we're falling and failing and going backwards. That was my view. For most, most of my Christian life, including my spirituality, it was, it was very Western, bigger, better, faster, moving forward. My job was to be a model of a solid Christian. I, I prided myself on my stability. If there were setbacks and disappointments or crises, I, I would say, hey, I'm, just stand firm. In fact, when I met a depressed person who couldn't seem to come out of it, I'd say to myself, where's their faith? Like, what's the problem here? And uh, because I didn't let myself even go there. And, and when I did feel sadness or grief, um, again, I wouldn't let myself. I would just quote you know, verses like David in, in the Psalms who said, with God's help, I can scale a wall and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so needless to say, you know, if you were hurting or in pain, uh, even though I may be a pastor, I was not going to be the most helpful person in being compassionate or present with you. I, I basically wanted to give you a Bible verse and fix you and help you to move on. But sadly, the Bible teaches the very opposite. Uh, in fact, grief and loss is a central discipleship issue for all followers of Christ. It's meant to be one of the main ways that God enlarges or expands our soul and transforms us into lovers of him and other people. In fact, grieving and loss changes us like few other things in life. I have been thinking about biblical grieving for many years. and In fact, a theology of grieving in scripture can be broken down into three basic phases. First, I pay attention to my losses. And we see, for example, in the prayers of David in the Psalms. In fact, two thirds of the Psalms are griefs and loss. We see Job, Jeremiah. Job, for 35 chapters, he, he's screaming out in pain. He's holding nothing back. He, he curses the day of his birth. He goes, oh, may the day of my birth perish. If only my anguish could be weighed and all the misery be placed on the scales. I would, it would surely outweigh the sands of the seas. Job writes, the arrows of the Almighty are in me. I mean, that guy's in pain. And again, we forget that most of the Psalms, two-thirds were written by David and others. They're laments. In other words, they're complaints to God about losses. David shouts at God. He rages at God. He prays wild prayers to God. He tells God exactly what he's feeling. Uh, in fact, this is the one prayer book or book of worship we have in all of Scripture and to think about it, two-thirds of it is laments. David wrote poetry after the death of Saul. He wrote a song about his best friend dying as well, Jonathan. And he commands his army to stop, his army to stop and to sing a lament of grief to God. It's found in 2 Samuel. We have an entire Old Testament book called Lamentations. And yet we don't lament. Ezekiel lam lamented, Daniel grieved, Jesus wept over Lazarus. He cried out over in grief. Uh, with Jerusalem. Biblical grieving calls us to pour out our feelings and losses, and we do that before God. And so when I became a Christian, even with anger, I was taught that that was a sin. I, I, th I thought, you know, like Jesus, I, I'm, I'm, I thought that if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, I'm going to stuff it. My feelings of irritation, annoyance, resentments, my bitternesses. And, and, and so in doing so, I, I missed God in so many ways. I would let people cross my boundaries. They would say and do hurtful things to me that maybe were disrespectful. And I'd stuff it rather than seeing it as maybe God's coming to me to, to, to assert myself and set a respectful boundary here and say something. 
I'd be angry when, I, when there were limits that I couldn't get something done, uh, say in the church or in my personal life. And I didn't take time to process that before God, that a lot of it was impatience. A lot of it was the fact that I wanted to be in control and God's in control, not me. And I was missing how God was seeking to transform me through things like that. And you see, when we don't process before God, the very feelings that make us human, such as fear and sadness or anger, we end up leaking, at, leaking it out in sarcasm and passive aggressive behavior, silent treatments, all kinds of things. Our churches are filled with leaking Christians who have not treated their emotions as a discipleship issue. And so grieving is not possible without paying attention to our anger, our sadnesses, our fears. Most people who fill our churches are nice and they're respectable, but few explode in anger, at least in public. And the majority like me stuff these difficult feelings, trusting that God will honor our noble efforts. And the result is that we leak through soft ways, such as showing up late and a nasty tone of voice and giving people the silent treatment. So first, we pay attention to our griefs and losses. The second phase, biblically, is that we wait in the confusing in-between. Now, I hate waiting. I hate waiting for subways, buses, airplanes, for people. Like most New Yorkers, I struggle not to finish other people's sentences. I talk too fast. But David in the Psalms and other greats in Scripture, we see them waiting on God. David waits on God as he flees Saul and hides in the desert from his enemies. He knows God is good. He knows God's love endures forever. And so he's able to wait on God. The problem is that the circumstances don't look very good. And we experience the same struggle. Something's over, something we've lost. We've had a setback and, and yet God invites us to, to wait. Now again, I prefer control to waiting. And I understand why Abraham, for example, after waiting 11 years for God's promise of a son to come true, he took matters in his own hands. He had a baby outside of marriage with Hagar. And in doing so, he birthed Ishmael. Birthing Ishmael's is common in both our churches and our personal lives. But yet scripture calls us to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him, Psalm 37. It remains one of the most radical commands even to this day. It requires enormous humility. The confusing in between resists all earthly categories and quick solutions. It runs contrary to our entire culture. But I've got news for you. God is not in a rush. Waiting on him is life. It's not just waiting on God to do something for us. God calls us to actually wait on him. And that's part of the grief process. Something's over, the old is gone, the new has not come, and here we are waiting on God, trusting he is good and his love endures forever. But there is a third phase to biblical grieving, and that is letting the old birth the new. Good grieving is not just letting go but it's also letting it bless us. The central message of, of Jesus and the entire Bible is that suffering and death bring resurrection and transformation eventually. Jesus himself said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. But remember, resurrection only comes out of a death, out of a real death. It only comes after an ending. Our losses are very, very real. But as we pay attention and we wait on God in our losses and griefs, no matter how long it takes, God over time births resurrection. Our God is alive. And if we will follow the biblical process of grieving, always there is a resurrection of some sort over time. There are many rich fruits that blossom in our lives as a result of embracing our losses. The greatest, however, concerns our relationship to God and to ourselves. When we grieve God's ways, we are changed. We're changed forever. It's one of the major ways God grows us into spiritual maturity. Loss marks the place where self-knowledge and powerful transformation happen. If we have the courage to participate fully in the process. We all face many deaths over time in our lives. That is God's path for all of us, but don't be discouraged. The choice is whether these deaths will be terminal, crushing our spirit and life, or will open us up to new possibilities, new maturities, and new depths of transformation in Christ. All right, guys. I'm hoping that you guys enjoyed that video as much as I did. Uh, he did a, a great job at explaining uh, how to process through grief in a positive, uh, biblical way. Now, 
what I want to do is we're going to take a look in the uh, in the workbook, a section that talks about how Jesus himself actually processed in and through grief. So, um, you know, at the end of Jesus's vibrant, uh, popular earthly life and ministry uh, was an enormous loss to his disciples and followers. It was also, as we see, an enormous loss for Jesus. So let's take a look in Matthew 26, uh, verses 36 through 44. I'll read it and then we'll discuss it. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and his two son, the two sons, Zebedee, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch for me. Going a little bit further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the, to the disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. So in that account, we see Jesus and at a, at a very dark moment. Let's take a look at some ways that before we get into what Jesus does, I'd like to talk about um, some unhealthy or unbiblical ways that we process grief. One would be denial uh, or selective forgetting. We refuse to acknowledge some painful aspect of our reality. Things come out of our mouth like, I feel just fine. It didn't bother me. I'm not worried about it at the least. So that's denial. Or minimalizing. We admit something's wrong, but in such a way that it, it appears much less serious than it actually is. Or blaming others. We deny responsibility for our behavior and project it out there upon another person. Blaming yourself. We um, inwardly take on fault. And this is something that um, I see often. It is, it's framed as uh, low self-esteem. Or rationalizing. We offer excuses or justifications. Believe it or not, we can also, um, in an unhealthy manner, uh, deal with grief through or loss through intellectualizing it. We give analysis or theories or generalities, uh, avoid personal awareness uh, and difficult things. My situation is not that bad compared to how others uh, are suffering out in the world. Why should I cry? Those type of thoughts. Or distracting. We change the subject or engage in humor to avoid threatening topics. The next one I would say, um, well actually let me give an example of distracting. Why are you so focused on the negative? Ever heard that comment? That's a way to distract the conversation and, and someone's grief and to move around it or becoming hostile. We get angry or irritable when reference is made to a certain subject. So, denial, minimalizing, blaming others, blaming yourself, rationalizing, intellectualizing, distracting, or becoming hostile. So, with those in mind, 
Um, I would say it's important for us to remember that Jesus was both human um, and fully God. Spent a few moments, uh, we we need to spend a few moments focusing on uh, Jesus in verses 36 through 41. And then contrast them with the, there's a list uh, that I just gave. Contrast them with that list. What were some of the ways that Jesus um, dealt with or, or moved through his loss? In that section, we see that uh, Jesus himself was in community. He actually had a few guys with him that he brought with him. So one of the things that he did is he embraced other people and embraced um, bringing in community. That is one way that um, I see that he he dealt with it. The other thing I would say is when he went and, and prayed three times, he didn't skirt around the issue. He dealt directly with the situation that was grieving him. He laid the very issue that was breaking his heart or crushing him in spirit. He was laying that at God's feet. So he didn't go around it. He didn't avoid it. Um, I would say he didn't, no denial. He didn't deny it. He didn't minimize it. He wasn't blaming others. He didn't even rationalize it. He dealt with it directly and hit it head on. He postured himself with humility. He had a a sense of humility about him when he was coming before the Father. What about Jesus' example of grieving most speaks to you about embracing your own grief or loss? What was it about his way of doing things um, spoke most to you? To me, as an answer from, from my perspective, it would be that it seemed he was fully dependent on the Father. He He wasn't... Uh, independent. He knew that there was a situation at hand, a calling that he was given to go do, a task at hand, and and he was depending on the Father. Nevertheless, your will be done. There's a chart that Pete Cazero gives us in the um, in the workbook. And it's basically a chart that has um, best described as this. It it says to take a couple blocks of your uh, years. So he has like uh, years being age 3 through 12, 13 through 18, 19 through 25, 26 through 40, 41 plus. And then he has two. Let's say this is this is the 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 3 through 12, 13, and then he has two that are going down. And those are labeled loss and disappointment experience. So he says, take basically using the chart, choose two or three age ranges of your life and write down your significant losses during those years. I'll give you some examples and I would definitely encourage you to do the same. Uh, It'll help open your eyes to the things that you are dealing with and how you're coping with them. And then you can go back to the idea of healthy um, ways of actually processing through. For me, it was uh, age three through 12. Um, we ended up, my, my brother, uh, my brothers and I um, got taken from our home and uh, twice and ended up in foster care and group homes. And so um, my loss was the loss of a whole family. We were separated. Every, each of the kids were all separated. Um, so I, I lost my whole family. Um, in respo- And then the next column, it says, your response at that time. My response at that time was 
I felt so much shame and and fear and embarrassment and and identity disruption, if you will, um, that I made up stories that I literally I just lied. I, I made up stories of who I was and and um, because I, I didn't want to deal in my reality. I wanted to deny what was actually happening. Another one would be um, I became homeless at uh, 15 and a half. And so um, becoming homeless uh, was my loss or disappointment experience. Um, my response at the time was to hide in drugs, was to uh, blame other people, was to distract distraction in that moment was through drugs um, and I tried to hide in that. Those are some situations that I experienced. Those are some um, losses and disappointments and how I responded at the time. Now, the next question is, once you take some time to do that, what was the experience of filling out the chart like for you? Did it reveal anything new to you? Some things maybe that you didn't uh, expect to find. One of the central messages of Christianity is that suffering and death brings resurrection and new life. Are there any losses you have not yet embraced where new life is still waiting to be birthed? Now, remember, in Pete's video, I talked about <coughs> the negative aspects. I talked about how Jesus uh, made his way through. He had hit it head on and he didn't uh, skirt the issue. He, he dealt with it in a very, uh, very mature, spiritually mature way. Pete talked about this path to new beginnings, about how Job, um, in, the, in his book, he literally has a whole section on how Job processed through. And, and the main area was that, you know, Job paid attention. One of the things that he said, Pete said, was we need to pay attention and that we don't have a very good theology um, for this in church. And that's why uh, a lot of people that don't process these things end up uh, in our churches, feel they're, they're leaking all over the place. They're leaking anger, they're, they're leaking frustration or sadness or fear. Um, and, and people often wonder, why does the church suck? <laughs> Why do people, why are they so mean? I heard lately quite a bit, people are talking about how church people are mean. And it's probably because they're a bunch of individuals like myself that have deep-seated issues that have not been processed properly. And so they're leaking out all over the place. And that's what this is designed to do, is to literally bring a healthy maturity into someone's life. So that they're not mean, they're responding and acting in a manner that looks more like Jesus. He talked about um, not only paying attention to what's going on in us, like Job. You know, Job was screaming and kicking and uh, for 30 something odd chapters, arguing with God and doubting and all sorts of stuff. In... The second one that he gave, the second step would be waiting in the confusion of the in-between. Waiting in the confusing in-between. Um, there are some things that God will call us to wait in that are very long. Maybe, and I don't want to make light of this, maybe it's a marriage that is really been on the rocks and you've been there for a long time or a wayward child that has not come home and is destroying their life and you just desperately want them to to turn around but it's been a long long time 
those are those seasons where God does an, an incredible amount of work in us. And I don't mean that in a flippant pastoral take two verses and call me in the morning type of attitude. I've had some really long seasons of uh, grieving myself years. And uh, I have a, a daughter who was taken from me when she was six and I didn't meet her until I until she was 22 and and then she took off again and uh, so you know I, I understand long grieving but embracing that time helps us to understand God in a deeper way we are sitting at his feet we're laying those things at his feet that burden us so much uh, they break us in a way um, spiritually and make us be we become the poor in spirit which in the bible says blessed are the poor in spirit the third one was embracing the gift of limits we have limits in our physical body in our family of origin um, our marital status our intellectual capacity uh, our talents and gifts our material wealth our raw materials of who we are and just our personality and whatnot extrovert introvert all that sort of thing your time is limited um, your work and relationship uh, relationships are, are also uh, all uh, limits they all have limits to them we're made up of limits I'd love to think that I can, uh, I used to be a sponsored skateboarder. I, I would love to boost airs the way I used to, but I just have grown old. Yes, I said it old. And so the reality is, I just can't do what I used to do. Things break down over time. And maybe you're just given those limits from the get-go. What that does is it often makes us um, frantic we if we don't if we're not aware of our limits that's why it says embracing but the reason why it's so important to embrace them is because if we're not aware of them truth is we're going to try try and outdo uh, our limits and frustrate ourselves and others around us all the time it just breaks us down now the fourth thing that comes about uh in the time of waiting and um, embracing our limits is is actually building a posture of humility. Um, Pete Scazzaro talks about the St. Benedict's Ladder of Humility. You can look that up. Um, but I would just say embracing a posture of humility because at the end of the day, um, that's kind of that area that last comes about as a fruit of being... Um, in that grieving process properly when you really spend the time to pay attention to what's going on and not hide it or, or skirt around it when you wait in the confusing times of in between uh, and embrace your limits you're gonna find that it will birth humility and that will lead to the old um, life being made new that you'll literally be in that new, rich, uh, fruitful season of um, having the results that God intends with grief and loss being properly processed. So that's a lot to digest. There's a ton in the book. I really suggest uh, getting the actual book. Um, it's, it's amazing and uh, it will help you. Uh, process through I've gone through it multiple times now and uh, I, I learned something new and I the reality is we're continually growing right so I unfold a new layer of something in me every single time so I hope that that uh, helped you guys um, I just want to close in prayer because this is a heavy one so father I pray that the people that will be watching this my brothers and sisters out there, Lord, that they would learn to process grief and loss in a biblical way. I pray that you would carry them through the journey, that you would walk with them and bring as 
Jesus did some community along with them. Safe community. Lord, I praise you and thank you for what you've done in my life through this book. And I just ask that you would do the same in my brothers and sisters and even more. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys next week. Uh, if you want to get a peek ahead, um, we're actually going to be taking a look at Discover the Rhythms of the Daily Office and Sabbath. How important it is to our growth. So, love you guys. Hope to see you soon.